and welcome to the Blockchain and Us, where pioneers and thought leaders talk about their journey in blockchain technology, crypto assets, and the token economy. And I'm your host, Manuel Staggers. This episode has support from Core Ledger. Core Ledger is a blockchain based peer to peer transaction infrastructure provider. It enables businesses to document, tokenize, and trade any type of assets in a reliable and flexible environment. Core Ledger makes anything transactable, literally anything. To learn more about Core Ledger's technology and how you can transform your business onto blockchain, visit coreledger.net. That's C O R E L E D G E R.net. Coreledger.net. My guest today is Mervyn Maestri. Mervyn is CEO and founder of Confidio, a blockchain venture studio in Berlin, and chairman of Kintaro Capital. He graduated medical school and worked in pediatrics in South Africa, and he also held key positions at prestigious organizations such as COO of Deutsche Bank, global managing partner at Accenture, and managing partner digital strategy and transformation lead at EY. Mervyn also advises various projects in the blockchain and business world, including Slocket, Deep.org, and Siberian Mine. And now to the conversation with Mervyn Maestri. Hi, Mervyn, and many thanks for taking time today. It's a pleasure. Mervyn, you're running Confidio here in Berlin, a venture studio in the blockchain space. So let's get started with what Confidio does. Yeah. Uh, we essentially a, a, a blockchain venture studio. We started out with a number of ideas uh, about where we could develop blockchain products um, that solved problems today. And of course, naturally, uh, in the space, uh, blockchain is a really it's a it's a really beautiful, fantastic technology, and so we can see the. The future potential, yeah, the, the potential that the blockchain has to change the world in 10, 20 years. I think that most visionaries can see, and that's great. Uh, my focus was, okay, we are working towards that vision, uh, but we can't spend uh, uh, money working on that vision for the next 10 or 20 years without, uh, without it being sustainable. So how do we make that entire... Uh, experiment with the blockchain sustainable. Uh, so every long-term vision we had, whether it was in energy, whether it was in uh, uh, contract management, whether it was in legal, uh, we always asked ourselves the question. In fact, we've developed a, a, a quite a clear methodology of how we go through these, um, these ideas. Uh, and we always ask ourselves the question, well, what problems can the technology with its current level of maturity solve today? Uh, so we developed a, 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 a very nice two by two, classical sort of strategy consulting two by two, where we looked at what business problems are really well defined and what, what level the blockchain technology maturity is and how can we solve those problems? And then, of course, naturally going far out, uh, the potential of the blockchain in the future, as well as uh, uh, the idea of a, a decentralized future uh, with business problems and opportunities that are not that well defined. Uh, that is in the sort of top right hand corner where most of the value is. Um, and uh, that's part of our roadmap. So strategically, we put that into part of our roadmap. Uh, the reason you people ask is, well, why have you gone through this? I think it's quite important uh, as, a, as a blockchain venture studio with a number of different ventures that I'm able to attract people who really have the vision, who are excited about the blockchain, have passion about the, uh, the technology and have passion about what the technology can do to change the world. Mm -hmm. So that's very important for us. Yeah? So a passion of understanding the strategy, the technology, and the opportunity of what the technology and the business models can do in the future. Mm -hmm. Do you have specific a specific focus on on use cases or applications? Um, our specific focus was based on agreements between people 
and parties. Yeah. Um, uh, as you know, I come from a, a, an investment banking background and a healthcare background. Um, most of the most of the commerce that exists in the world today are essentially agreements between entities. That entity can be a company, it can be a person, it can be a small and medium enterprise, it can be a global corporation. But essentially, all business interaction takes place in the form of contracts. Those contracts are governed by legal clauses, and that's how we do business. Yeah. Um, and so my initial focus was what efficiency can the blockchain bring to that process as well as who are all of the gatekeepers and the rent seeking middlemen in that process that we can knock out as a result uh, so that's our focus and we've applied that core business model knowledge to virtually every venture we're involved in you have another tagline i think it reads uh, decentralized solutions for real world problems I mean, you just described the contracts, I think that makes a lot of sense to, to cut out the middlemen. But this idea of decentralization also seems quite important, I think, in your work. So why do you think decentralization is the solution to, to many of today's problems? I think to discuss why decentralization is important, you have to discuss why centralization is important. Yeah. And centralization uh, is very Uh, ha has served the business world and the normal society extremely well. So I think that's the first point to, to, to understand. And many of the, many of the marketing evangelists that have come to the space in the short term uh, talk about decentralization like it's some sort of ideology and some sort of mantra. Uh, and so when we talk about decentralization, we're talking about decentralizing the world by just increasing access and increasing people's access to power, people's access to control. Um, and so when we talk about decentralization, it's basically talking about the inefficiencies of centralization. Yeah. Um, and then maybe a, a further explanation is that centralization is extremely inefficient but it is extremely effective. So um, it's inefficient because you insert a number of governance processes into, uh, into any organization. You insert a, number, a, a lot of centralized control into an organization. Uh, and all of that costs quite a lot of money. Uh, it's extremely effective because it's, it generally prevents quite a lot of corruption It certainly adds to transparency at the center. Not full transparency, but certainly better transparency than without that. The blockchain is the first technology that's given us the possibility to decentralize those inefficient parts of centralization, keeping the effectiveness of centralization, but making the transparency a lot better and allowing Any, any person or entity engaged in that ecosystem to verify that no one has tampered with the data that they are looking at because the data is immutable. And so if you look at it like that, you realize that the blockchain is, that, that's why for me the blockchain is a seminal technology. It basically changes centuries of organizational design. Yeah. Uh, When it, when it works. Now, you notice I said when it works, not if it works. Yeah. Because I'm convinced, and I think we have now enough proof, at least in the work that we're doing, that when decentralization works, it is extremely powerful. Yeah. So that is the key reason why we're talking about a decentralized world. Uh, and I... Yeah, there's some issues about centralization which are actually quite efficient and effective, but those are special cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of efficiency, right? I mean, some blockchains are extremely inefficient as well. If um, you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, I mean, it's inefficiency by design. Uh, I think the, for me, that's one of the one of the um, misconceptions. Um, I have worked in banking, yeah, um, and. 
what happens in the banking system is that at the end of every day, globally, literally tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions, are unaccounted for. Yeah. Uh, most people don't realize that. Um, the only reason you don't realize that is because people have agreements. They have legal contracts between banks and customers, uh, the commercial banks, the retail banks, the central banks, the clearing houses. They all have an agreement about how the banking system will work and the consumer doesn't see any of that behind the curtain. But that inefficiency is, is huge. Um, in that inefficiency, it requires for me to have, uh, say, for example, I am Deutsche Bank or Citibank. I have got huge skyscrapers in a number of the global capitals. Yeah. I employ tens of thousands of people. All of these people drive to work every day in cars that burn petrol, or they go to work on a bus, or uh, they go to work using uh, on a train that might be using electricity that's driven by coal. Um, and then they all sit on their computers in their offices. And so the cost of the transaction, if you're really comparing apples with apples, you need to compare the, the entire infrastructure of all the banks in the world who are participating in a normal transaction. And then you've got a clear apples to apples comparison. And then you can talk about the number of kilowatt hours that a bank uses for each transaction and the number of kilowatt hours that a Bitcoin uses for every transaction. And if you don't do that comparison, you're basically bullshitting the public through very nice short statements that actually mean nothing. So I've re read, a, I've read a lot of the articles and when someone talks about this, this idea of the blockchain being in, or the Bitcoin blockchain being inefficient, uh, you really know that they have not gone into the depth of what it means. The, the next point is that the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, the Litecoin blockchain, the Filecoin blockchain, uh, any blockchain that uses proof of work as a consensus mechanism will, by definition, you require a lot of computing power, which then by definition requires quite a lot of energy. Um, you need to then, you, you have to compare that to the alternative in the centralized world before you can make any clear uh, uh, statement. But that denies that you, there are other consensus mechanisms. Uh, they're not as elegant as proof of work. They're not as independent as proof of work, but they are a lot more efficient. So I can reach a level of decentralization in transactions by using, for example, a proof of authority. Yeah. Um, and that's where the ideology comes in. Uh, you have people who, are, who suddenly in the last year discovered the word decentralization and are talking about a decentralized, and decentralized for, decentralization for them is like an ideology. Yeah. It's a fundamentalism. Um, it's like you meet a fundamentalist Christian, and what do they say? Jesus Christ is the answer to everything. You meet a fundamentalist Muslim, uh, you have Allah is the answer to everything. You meet a fundamentalist Bitcoin maximalist, Bitcoin is the answer to everything. And then you meet a fundamentalist decentralized person and decentralization is the answer to everything. That for me is just, th that sort of fundamentalism is fueled at its core by ignorance. Yeah. So we look specifically at what, what is the problem, what is the most efficient, effective way to solve that problem, and is the business model to solve that problem sustainable? So that's, that, that's the key sort of foundational strategic measures that we use. And it could be to solve a problem effectively and efficiently, I, I will use a combination of both a centralized and a decentralized solution. I'm completely comfortable with that. And Confidio's built on that. We are not here to, to, to make an ideology come alive. Yeah, we're here to solve problems and to make the world a better place. And uh, to make the world a better place does not involve ideology. In fact, if you want to make the world a worse place, you can be ideological about it. Mm, yeah, I think it's a great point that you brought up there. There's so many misconceptions about this technology, but also about the potential, of course, of the technology. And um, 
One of them we, we briefly discussed before we started recording is, is the matter of fundraising. So how today, in your experience, are startups in the blockchain field raising their funds? And, you know, who are the investors? And what are maybe their misconceptions about this technology? So I think, um, as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the interview, the blockchain has this marvelous potential. And in this potential, I can see solutions like a completely decentralized peer-to-peer -peer energy system globally or a global system of payment processing on the blockchain globally. Um, and all of these solutions will require 15, 20 years to really reach the stage of this nirvana of complete decentralization. Um, and of course, no investor is willing to, to fund that. Um, and then came the concept of crowdfunding. And that happened in, 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 with Ethereum. And uh, I was lucky enough to be, to have understood a little bit about the blockchain then. Um, and then a, a, a number of other crowdfundings came through. Um, then the ICO or the, the smart contract that enabled the ICO was developed. Uh, and then people thought, okay, I'm going to change the world. And instead of asking an investor who's looking for short-term gains, to, I'm going to ask a community to do this. And so the, the concept of the ICO at its core is also quite empowering. Um, and I have to admit, uh, in, in, in 2015, I... I I gave a talk at the ICO summit in Linz, one of the first ones. Uh, I thought ICOs would be would be fantastic, uh, but one forgets that criminal energy is like water. Yeah, it will find a way, and so within a short time, you had ICOs popping up all over the place, uh, offering completely crazy things, um, and investors were stupid enough to believe it without really reading the details of the white paper. And then you realize that what blockchain does not change, it does not change this emotional fear of missing out and it doesn't make suddenly make investors a lot more intelligent. Yeah. So people invested because their friends would have invested and uh, it went, this sort of uh, bubble went quite well because everyone threw darts at a dartboard and everyone made money. Um, at least the, the people who went in early, the majority of the people who came in, sort of anyone who came in in 2018, for example, is now bleeding. Yeah. Um, so, so I think the ICO was a good first step. It was an important step in the development to looking at other methods of capital raising. Um, now I, I think the concept of a security token or a Uh, better said, an, a token which represents any financial instrument, but which follows all the rules that guarantee investor protection. Uh, I think that's, that is certainly coming on board. Um, one of the key things has been uh, venture capitalists. I mean, venture capitalists, and I think this is the misconception about venture capitalism that people have. Venture capitalists exist only to do one thing. Yeah. They exist to make themselves wealthy. Yeah. And they are not interested in the long-term viability of a product. They are interested in a successful Series A. Yeah. So a venture capitalist, if it, through a successful Series A, becomes wealthy. Uh, and then the, the one out of the 100 that go on to become a unicorn, uh, uh, one of them makes some money. Uh, but mostly they're interested in the Series A. So venture capitalists have fueled this, in my opinion, they've fueled the, uh, the corruption in the space because they've, they've realized that everyone has uh, got this fear of missing out. So a lot of them have started taking stakes in ICOs or taking equity stakes in someone before they went to ICO. Um, now that the market has collapsed, that has stopped. It hasn't stopped because... Venture capitalists have suddenly realized this was corrupt. They've suddenly realized, okay, our Series A, we've no chance of getting money by tokens quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think one of the problems is that most people in venture capital just don't understand the blockchain. Uh, I've seen people in venture capital who 
uh, through a dot at a dot board in 2015, become wealthy and suddenly they are somehow meant to be brilliant in the space. And actually, in my experience, I found that the people who are most brilliant in the space are people who are not completely obsessed with money. Yeah. The people who are most brilliant in the space around blockchain are people who are concerned about solving problems. People are concerned about the planet. Those people are, for me, they, they develop a much deeper interest in what the technology can do. Uh, and uh, so when I hire people, it's the, the clear thing is to figure out whether they are problem solvers, whether they're interested in doing something for the planet and their communities. And naturally, everyone needs to be comfortable. Uh, but you can, when you interview someone, you can see what their priorities are. Mm -hmm. So I certainly check that very carefully. If someone's overly obsessed with money or getting rich or f is following the crypto markets every day, you know they are not the best people for innovation. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, you just said hiring people for your own organization, but of course you're also looking at a lot of projects to invest in. So maybe let's say I had an idea for a blockchain project, you know, that um, has to do with contracts, for example, that also looks at decentralizing a solution that was previously inefficiently centralized. And I wanted to get involved somehow with Confidio and wanted to draw, you know, your attention to my project. So how would I go about doing this? Um, I think there are, in my opinion, there are three things which, which I, I would look for. I really look to see how well someone has been able to define the problem uh, and define the solution to that problem. Also, uh, in definition of the problem and definition of the solution, to understand what the value is of of solving this problem. Yeah. Um, because the value of solving the problem has got to give you some advantage. Uh, I think those are the three key things that I look for. And then I would look for, okay, when you solve this particular problem and the, the value of solving that problem is X, what is the next step? What, would you, what, what is your view when the technology develops further, when there's scalability on the blockchain, uh, when we have interoperability on the blockchain? How would your solution develop further? And then you can have a look at the vision that people have. Uh, so in all of that together, I think that's uh, that's that's what I what, that's what I'm looking for. Um, one of the key things where someone is virtually the conversation doesn't even last that long is that when they're talking about they need to develop a token, they're not sure what the token can do, but they know the token is good for fundraising. Yeah, uh, those people w waste my time because it's. Uh, And so generally those conversations, as soon as I hear that sort of argument, uh, the, the, the meeting ends roughly within about five minutes from the time I hear that argument. Because you know these people are not serious. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, certainly in my experience at Deutsche Bank, at Accenture, uh, uh, at EY, the people who are more interested in solving a problem or or really looking at an opportunity, an opportunity to change something, uh, those people tend to be a lot more successful than the people who are first looking at where can I make some money. Yeah. So, uh, and I, uh, yeah, I'm sure in, the, in, in 2017 and 2016, you've had a lot of people who wanted to make money and threw darts at a dartboard. I think that's a, that's a blip. The, the, the exception proves the rule. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. When you, when you look at startups or also entrepreneurs' ideas, what, you know, besides what you just mentioned, that they have to focus and define the problem really well and their solution too, what else do you think they should be better at, you know, when they present their ideas? Um, at the moment, I mean, one of the things I used to say in answer to that question, which, I, which I'm slowly changing my mind on, is the concept of look for someone who's got a good team behind them. Um, and what I've realized is that was, uh, I've been following quite a lot around uh, who manages to raise money through VCs. And uh, what I've been following as well is the, um, the, um, the VCs themselves, uh, how, they, how they're allocating money. Um, and I think at the moment we are looking at um, 
at how well someone really understands strategy, uh, project management, uh, and finance. Yeah. So, the, so some of the core capabilities. The reason for that is I think if you concentrate on the team, what we've discovered is that most VCs are generally run by white males. And they are more comfortable giving money to other white males. In fact, I've had uh, three VCs now in the last two years who've told me personally to get more white males on board because we have 22 nationalities here. And they were quite clear. They said, you know, if we, if we, uh, one, one guy actually said to me, he got quite upset when I said that it was, uh, I thought that was, uh, I actually said, I used the word disgusting. Uh, he got quite upset. He said, it's a purely financial decision uh, because they know that teams that are generally dominated by white males have much more success at a series A. Mm. And, and that again is of course of the investor bias there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I thought about that for a long time and actually from a, in a purely clinical objective view, forget about your philosophy and your, 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 the, fa the, the fact that you might be uh, uh, disgusted by discrimination in whatever form, from in a purely clinical objective way, he's completely, he was completely right. He and his team was completely right. Um, Because currently people who allocate money or people who participate in Series A give money to people who look like them. Um, and, so the concept of, and, and so the concept of looking at the team only, I think, is a, is a flawed concept. Um, It's the VC's way of looking at the, yeah, the investment. Yeah. And so I, I, I spend a lot of time concentrating on the, the real nuts and bolts of the solution. Uh, and then understanding how how someone is able to implement, whether someone has managed large teams before, whether someone is, has a clear idea about who they should be hiring, having a clear understanding of what roles they need, what skills they need, um, and not looking at the team behind them. Uh, and the ICOs prove that as well. You had a number of people, who all, they, all they did was they went out and got a whole number of advisors, put them on their website, Advisors knew nothing about it, but they had good networks and good contacts. Um, and I think that's uh, networks, having good networks is a very good way to get short-term success. Um, but uh, our role, um, at least my role at the moment, and my, my vision and my passion is not about uh, raise, raising money quickly. It's really about solving problems quickly using using a combination of technologies. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And like you said before, you said the uh, horizon is maybe 10, 15 years. Yeah. So it won't be quickly. It won't be quick. We, uh, I have, uh, but uh, I did say that the big visions are 10 to 15 years old. Hmm. Yep. We have found a number of areas where blockchains with the technology of, of uh, verification, of auditability, of traceability, uh, of having clear governance roles embedded into smart contracts, Uh, legal clauses put into smart contracts, uh, automated dispute resolution, all of those functionalities of the blockchain can be used to solve current problems. And we have got one of our flagship product, for example, solves a key problem in a $3.7 trillion industry. Yeah. So managed services for us is really uh, using the blockchain uh, with partial decentralization, not full decentralization, achieves uh, or unlocks a lot of value from rent-seeking middlemen uh, and makes business models more efficient. So uh, that's one, one case. Uh, normal things, what you can use at the moment, are things like uh, carbon certificates, carbon trading, uh, invoicing and billing on the blockchain, um, uh, putting the customer at the center of a platform, Uh, we're experimenting with a case like that at the moment, um, allowing people to order technology, uh, for example, in, 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 uh, in any mining, proof-of-work mining like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Zcash, etc., where we can then using the blockchain verify, sorry, I'll read that, where we using the blockchain, we can verify to investors that all the energy sources that we use to mine come our renewable energy sources. We can also make sure that on the blockchain an investor knows that this machine belongs to me. 
this machine, when it's mining, produces X number of Bitcoin, Litecoin, Zcash, whatever. Uh, and so that gives investors transparency and traceability, um, which, which I think does away with some of the centralization of pooling, which of course just lends itself to corruption. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. This episode has support from Core Ledger. Core Ledger is a blockchain-based peer-to-peer transaction infrastructure provider. It enables businesses to document, tokenize, and trade any type of assets in a reliable and flexible environment. Core Ledger makes anything transactable, literally anything. With Core Ledger's highly dependable, fast to implement products, businesses can reduce costs and improve processes. Individuals can benefit from the full ownership of their own assets and make transactions directly with another party. To learn more about Core Ledger's technology and how you can transform your business onto blockchain, visit coreledger.net. That's C O R E L E D G E R.net. Coreledger.net. You mentioned auditing before, and um, you were working at EY, yeah. one of the big four accounting firms uh, in the past, among, you know, yeah. next to other things that you've done before yeah. running Confidio. But why, in your experience or in your view, could a big four accounting firm like EY or, or maybe another big, you know, corporate in the world, a multinational corporation, why couldn't they run a venture studio that focuses on blockchain technology? like yours? Um, I think it's a very good question and the answer is actually very simple. Um, consulting firms are run by partners. Yeah, Most of those partners have come up through the ranks of that firm. So they know exactly in that particular business model how they make money. Yeah, And they make money through networks and, uh, and eventually what happens in partners in a in a consultancy or any of the big four, essentially they are the rent-seeking middlemen because they are the ones who sell the projects from their contacts in the various companies to the company. And so all the consultants they hire then do all the work and the partners get the benefits. Yeah, And that's the consulting model. The people doing the work do not get the majority of the benefit. Having been a partner in both at Accenture and at uh, uh, EY, Uh, that is definitely the truth. Um, they they find many ways to to sugarcoat that pill, but it's still uh, it's it's the truth. The other, I think that's the first problem. The second problem is that most of the partners are generally uh, uh, above forty. Yeah, those partners that are younger than forty, or those they have got to where they've got because they have participated in the network. They've known how to work the network within a, so whether it's a, a woman or whether it's a young guy or they've learned how to work that network. And so their skill and their success comes from participating in this traditional structure. Anything that is out of this traditional structure is a threat. So if I develop a blockchain product, for example, to automate auditing, Uh, I've got hundreds of partners whose livelihood I'm threatening. Yeah. Um, the other thing about them is, in my opinion, and having dealt with a lot of them, most of the most powerful partners are generally the older ones. Yeah. Uh, they're waiting to be pensioned off. They don't want anything that's going to disturb that. Yeah. They don't have the energy or the passion to try something different. Uh, they know what works, you know, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect. They know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. Uh, and perhaps out of 100 of them, two of them, maybe 2% will be interested in, in the future and the vision for the future, but they are in a tiny minority. Um, and so that's why I think that uh, in that space, they are they are not really interested in changing anything. What they're interested in is marketing an idea that they are innovative. Yeah. And that's what they do. So you set up a small little innovation hub somewhere and you create a marketing thing that you are really going to be the innovative person. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, so I think it's great 
for if you're a marketing person in innovation to be like that. And that's why it's no surprise to me, for example, that you find that most innovation hubs are driven by marketing partners mm. yeah? yeah, or uh, someone who's been in marketing and communications before. Yeah, exactly. Uh, mm. And that's also the case in corporates. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Um, or the person who's leading the innovation hub is the nephew of uh, one of the senior partners. Yeah, Or the person leading the innovation hub has a very good network into the uh, into the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. So people are getting this role not because of their not because of their passion about innovation or about their understanding of new technologies. They're generally getting the role because of their marketing network. Um, and in my experience, I think people who really are interested in the nuts and bolts of innovation, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. And so because it's not a priority at these companies, it's not taken into account. Um I was hoping that that would change. So uh, we did. Uh, I, I started the digital strategy practice at Accenture, and uh, my view was that because digitalization was moving so fast, it would have to change. Uh, so I think there has been some improvement, uh, but um, I think they're looking at the ways of making digitalization and innovation to increase their margins in their traditional business. They're not looking at innovation to create new businesses. Yeah. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm quite, I'm always quite skeptical about, uh, about innovation. Um, I've, or I've become quite skeptical about innovation in, in, in these larger corporates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And you did make the jump out of that structure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, part of the reason was I, I was really into the blockchain and, um, I, so one of the companies I worked for, I even went through an entire process of, trying to get them to support the Ethereum Foundation, buying Ether, um, and this was in 2015. Yeah, so I actually have the contract still. Uh, and eventually it was turned down hmm. because it was too risky. Hmm. And that's when I, it was part of the, dis the thinking process that I was going through, well, I'm just not, this is nothing that's going to go forward for me. And then um, I discovered how many of the senior levels of, of of partners or senior levels of innovation companies, etc., was supportive of someone like Donald Trump. Yeah. And I thought if you're supportive of such a dinosaur with such a backward view of the world, how 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 the hell do you ever really become passionate to support innovation? Yeah. So it was a combination of factors that made me make the jump. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. What you just mentioned is it's this mismatch between the enthusiasm to change the world with technology and the focus just on, you know, generating profit yeah. and extracting some rent. So, you know, in, in that regard, you also are involved with, with another project called Charity DAO. So maybe can you explain what, uh, what that is? Um, I mean, that came around, that came about, so I, I'm, um, I've known, uh, uh, the Jensch brothers for quite a few years now, and I'm an advisor to Slocket. Uh, I think most people who, who know the blockchain and listening to the podcast will know about the, the DAO, the first DAO that we was done in 2016. Um, and part of that project was also trying to figure out, could we support projects that, uh, are also for social good, not just for profit. Um, obviously, you know that's that's history. The DAO didn't work because of the of the of the someone exploiting the weakness in the code. Um, but the idea that Christoph and I then had, Christoph Jensch, we are both both the the co-founders of the charity DAO, was how do we use the technology that with this this beautiful technology that we love so much, how do we use it to try and make sure that um, we bring a brand new platform to the world of of uh, fundraising or developmental aid? And I don't particularly like the word charity, but uh, that's another story. Um, and I think because one of the key things that people are, are, are turned off about in, in, the, in, in giving welfare or charity or aid is that the, the perception of corruption, which is often true, and uh, they don't know how their money is being used. Mm. And this way, we figured out with smart contracts, you were, would be able to choose to give your money to a smart contract 
that specifically wanted to build a school or specifically wanted to provide vaccines uh, or specifically wanted to, fi uh, to fight, uh, 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 to advocate for gun control or even people who wanted to advocate, uh, and this was the, the, the objectiveness of the platform. If someone felt that um, advocating against gun control was going to contribute to a better world, then they could put their case forward and people who agreed with them could use the platform. So the platform was meant to be a fairly agnostic platform for people who wanted to change the world and who could prove to others that they could change the world um, with an idea of a clear audit trail. Uh, so you know where the money is being spent. If someone spent money on putting down a foundation for a school, you would have all the invoices to the, uh, that was used to buy the cement the invoice that was used to pay the company. Uh, you'd have all of that hashed to the blockchain. So you could very easily find out when uh, someone was, there was some sort of rent being paid, either in bribes or a higher price, etc. Mm -hmm. So that's the key idea. But I think that's very much what I was saying. That's a vision. And I think that's probably, uh, the technology will be mature enough for that probably in about three to five years. Mm. Yeah. At the moment, they're just individual experiments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Are there any specific use cases where you think it already shows big signs of promise in that space? I think one of the key things uh, is, is around property. So if you've got to build a school, for example, you can make a, a, a smart contract for that directly. And what you can then do is... Uh, say very clear the, the 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 school the building the school is in three phases phase one is the foundation when the foundation is complete the smart contract will release funds for the next phase and the next phase could be building the walls and the final phase could be uh, or the third phase could be put building the roof and the final phase could be employing teachers so what you could do and that's the power of smart contracts with business logic and legal clauses in it what i can then do is very easily say okay The foundation has been completed, therefore the next the money from the other donors are released, or the foundation the foundation has not been completed, uh, the the cement has not been bought, the company who's done laid the foundation has charged uh, is charging way too much, or the person who owns that company is the brother of the project manager. So all of those things you can quite easily check and then say, okay, gate one has not been passed. All the money collected so for that so far goes back to the donors and that project manager goes onto a list of people not to be trusted. Yeah. Uh, so that's the, that sort of concept is, is uh, I think at the moment is doable with the, uh, with the um, level of the technology as it is with a private chain, not a public chain. And just remember, I think that's a very important concept. So at the moment, public chains, in my opinion, are not ready for prime time if they do, they have more than one parameter. So the parameter of Bitcoin for dollars or Bitcoin for euros, that's one parameter, one exchange parameter. Uh, as soon as that contract becomes more complex and the proof of work becomes more complex and costs much more money, um, with the cryptocurrencies being as volatile as they are, public chains are at the moment a, uh, a less than, than, uh, a less than perfect choice. A private chain with, with proof of authorities and a governance layer is may not be completely decentralized, but it's still auditable, it's still traceable. Um, so you've got to look at you've got to look at designing solutions to solve the problem and not designing a solution to make it ideologically pure. Yeah. And so we, I'm, I make that distinction all the time. Um, I have a lot of friends who disagree with me, so I know that it raises quite a lot of. Uh, Uh, concerns with some people, but our role is not to be ideologues of the technology. Our role is to use blockchain with IoT, AI to solve a problem and to add value. That, that's where I see our role is. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And that role is obviously also developing, I think. That role is developing. I mean, and a part of the reason I like to keep my options open is that although I think I have 16 researchers working for me, I have 16 technologists, so 16 developers. Um, uh, although I know that we probably know 
more than most? There are a number of answers that are still unclear. Um, and we need to keep our options open to, so if we need to pivot, we can pivot. Uh, that's definitely a, uh, I, 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 like, I criticize people a lot who don't know what they don't know. So I spend virtually some time every day thinking about what don't I know that I'm not aware of yet. Yeah, so to, to, we, we discuss that a lot. What could happen? We get people to read what other people are saying. So we get an idea of what we don't know. I think that's a, that's that's very important for the for, yeah. It's very important for me that I carry on having the fun that I'm currently having, and that's part of it yeah, to 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 continuously learn. Mm -hmm. Interesting. In your in running Confidio, or also your just your personal life, what are you currently in the process of learning? I mean, one of the key things at the moment, in at least in the in in the blockchain space, that that Uh, I find fascinating is the concept of zero knowledge proofs. Yeah, I think that will solve a lot of problems with privacy. That will go a long way to protecting consumers. Um, and uh, so I, I find that particular area quite quite important. Uh, and then I think in my personal life, I'm reading quite a lot about uh, the philosophy of the future. Uh, so, what does that mean? It, it, how will societies develop? Yeah, um, and uh, the, there are there are real problems at the moment with uh, with I think legal tax avoidance. Um, so the wealth gap is increasing quite dramatically. What does that mean for how societies will develop? Um, what role does technology play in all of that? What role does digitalization play in all of that? Um, and then, of course, the one thing we that at least a number of my colleagues forget is that human beings are actually fairly emotionally irrational beings. Um, and uh, it's uh, quite important to realize that we are driven by sensation. We're not really always driven by rationality. Um, so reading uh, uh, Yuval Harari is, was, was quite useful for me. Um, and so even if we have this perfect, rational, auditable, traceable world, what are we going to need to do to beings that are essentially driven by sensation to make them adopt this? Yeah, Because the best technology in the world is completely useless if the majority of the people that it's meant to benefit don't like it and are not using it. And so that's, um, uh, that's something that's, that, that's actually bothering me quite a lot, especially when you realize, when you look in... in in places like America, for example, you try and analyze why do people constantly vote against their own economic interests? Um, it's a very simple thing to say that they're just stupid and ignorant, but could there be, you know, are, are there other reasons? Um, so I'm, I'm quite optimistic. Um, so it's difficult for me to just write off millions of people just because they're stupid or ignorant. Um, there's got to be a reason Uh, and a number of structural causes that keep them ignorant. Hmm. So, um, uh, yeah, so those are the important things that, uh, uh, that I sort of uh, try and make, try and at least understand who the experts are in those fields and read what they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Do you have mentors that you work with as well? Um, there are a number of people that I, that I, that I trust. So I, 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 I'm not, uh, I'm not, so maybe personally, I'm not, I don't believe in the hero culture. Yeah. So I don't believe that one person, uh, makes a big, uh, one person makes a difference, but they make a difference because of the context they find themselves in. So the mentors I have are very specific to specific areas. Um, so I have uh, one who works for the George Soros Foundation and I trust his opinion on most things social. Uh, in, uh, in terms of, uh, of the future, I really, I like looking at what Yuval Harari uh, is, is, is saying and, and, uh, and, uh, and writing. Um, and then I think, uh, someone who's a, a, a force for good at the moment. Uh, and it's quite thoughtful is Pope Francis. So, uh, 
So I would, I mean, in terms of uh, mentors in my daily life, I have one or two friends that I trust. Uh, the person I'm married to, I listen quite a lot to what he says. Uh, but generally, I think I don't, if I have a mentor, I trust what they're saying because they have the background knowledge in that area. Yeah. So, I, I, uh, so for example, what, uh, what Jack Dorsey said, uh, you know, the CEO of Twitter, he's a billionaire and he makes a comment about Bitcoin. Um, so I don't take that seriously at all. Yeah. Just because someone is wealthy does not mean that they have the means to make a, a decent, at least a well thought through opinion of mm. anything. He, he uh, said something like Bitcoin. Bitcoin, I, oh, Bitcoin is the only currency. So it's yeah. b- b- mm. uh, basically implying is a Bitcoin maximalist. I don't think he even knows what that means. But once again, he's very good at, at pushing up his own value. Mm-hmm. So he's probably bought Bitcoin and, uh, so I'm always looking at the, at that sort of, uh, Howard Schultz is another example. And at the moment, the real problem is that in the world is that people are listening to people who have money, uh, not people who have knowledge. Um, and uh, in the world I come from, at least my family and, uh, my friends, we generally have been interested in people who are who have been doing studies like university professors or doctors in charge of something or uh, the concept of listening to someone just because they were rich actually borders on vulgarity. Now it's actually become mm. fairly common. It's become a sort of uh, mainstream. Yeah. yeah I think exactly. that's a danger. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. And all these topics, I think, you know, there we could have a whole podcast just about, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> just about them. And it would yeah. be very interesting. Yeah. Um, if there was something that when you look back at your career up to now, is there something that you would do different? I mean, it's, um, it's, that's a very difficult, difficult question. I mean, I, one of the things that people have often said to me is, you know, you spend so much time studying medicine and uh, doing pediatrics and looking after kids. Why did you change? And would you, that was a number of years of your life would you if you were to do it again would you stop and the answer is no because i think that the um, medicine taught me a lot about you have to understand uh, you have to have a hypothesis first then you've got to investigate to see what the disease is then you've got to look at the investigations and then you treat yeah so uh, sounds just like your roadmap for, exactly yeah. and you can see you can you can you, actually you can see that pattern in virtually everything I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and where I said there's some things, for example, where centralization is important. Uh, and, and that's in one area is in sort of emergency medicine. Yeah. In emergency medicine, you don't want to ha- get, get a consensus about which doctor is treating you. If you've got a heart attack, you want to be treated immediately. If you've got blood leaking into your lungs, you want it stopped immediately. You're not going to try and Uh, do a consensus mechanism on the blockchain or anything like that. Yeah. And there you need a centralized body to say that someone is qualified to do heart surgery. Uh, you certainly don't want your friends and family uh, deciding who's qualified and who's not. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think f- there are things like that where I, I think about those lessons that I've learned and I think I would never have learned those lessons had I not done that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The same thing with Deutsche Bank. I mean, working in, in, in finance was a, was very, a, a very important lesson. And that's when I learned of how wealthy rent-seeking middlemen become. Uh, bankers become extremely wealthy and have zero interest in social value. Uh, bankers actually have no interest in making society better. Their only interest is in financial innovation to try and make themselves wealthy. There is, it's, it's a, it's, it borders on psychopathic behavior. And if I was never in that, in that field, I would never, never have learned all of the financial processes that I now know, which we use to disintermediate them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I, I don't think I would, would change anything. I think every, every single experience I've had has taught me something without which I wouldn't be the person I am today. And I actually... I quite like the person I am today. So, uh, I don't, you, you don't, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to try and change something that you, that you're happy with. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
What's next for you in the you know in the coming year maybe or the next one or two years? Mm, I think the uh, the important thing is we need to consolidate here at Confidio. We've got now a, a very successful technology stack. Uh, we have two of the blockchains that are the only blockchains globally that I know of that are actually deployed at corporates. One of them in a Fortune 100 company, um, and. Uh, so we're doing something right. Um, I think the question is to, 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 to consolidate what we're doing right and then figure out what our next step is in that roadmap. Um, but one of the things, we've spent a lot of money uh, developing this, this technology stack on the blockchain. And now what I'm doing is trying to uh, monetize that because we have to be sustainable um, and monetize that by putting it into an accelerator to help other companies who've got the good business model and who've got a very clear idea of how much solving the problem is worth. Um, and I think that's the next big step that we, we're currently doing is to make sure that all the ventures that we have and all the people we take into our accelerator, we make them usable. So they're not just a whole lot of marketing, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, And that's exciting. That's quite exciting. So, uh, and the other good thing that it, it, it's done, it's really given me some, made me meet some really, really bright people, really clever people who want to make money and who want to change the world. Uh, and I think that's the best combination because um, I have a lot of left-wing friends who just want to change the world and think the money's going to come from somewhere else. Uh, but I think the, the real... The real sustainable way to do that is to make sure that whatever solutions you have are making enough money to change the world. Yeah. Um, I don't think uh, anyone needs to be a billionaire. Yeah. I think you, if you're a billionaire, you're just sucking resources out of the planet. And, uh, but I think most people can live quite well uh, if they're millionaires. Uh, yeah, personally, I think... Uh, If, if you want to be, and one of the mottos we have here is that if you want to be a billionaire, you are just being greedy. You've grown up in the wrong value system. Yeah, good point. This was really great. I enjoyed the conversation a lot. Thanks a lot for taking time. So do I. Thank, thank, thank you very much for, for coming through. Thanks so much for joining us today. More info on our guests and our sponsors is in the show notes of this episode and on the podcast website, theblockchainandus.com. To help people find this podcast, it's important that you download, subscribe, and give it a top rating and review on iTunes or on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Manuel Staggers, and I thank you very much for listening. <laughs>